annual meeting of the World Economic Forum in Davos is like a club for singles. Everybody is going there to meet up, but nobody wants to spend time meeting up with the wrong person. Now, if you are an entrepreneur, social entrepreneur, Davos gives you the opportunity to meet that just that right person who might catapult your work to the next level. But picture the scene. Everybody in Davos wears a tag, much like you're wearing now. And they wander around the venue, not looking at people's <coughs> eyes. They're looking at your tag. Because you see, basically, if you are not the head of a Fortune 500 company, you are not some film star, a dot-com millionaire, or the president of a country, they don't look up. And strangely, they didn't seem to look up at me very often. Until, until that is, I found out that if at the very mo same time they looked at my tag, I did this. <laughs> they were forced to look at me in the eye, uh, but only, only long enough to know that they'd been had, and then they would move on. So, then out of the blue, I get a call saying, Richard Branson would like to meet with you and a few other social entrepreneurs. So with a fellow entrepreneur, um, Isaac Oni from Nigeria, we go and we meet with Richard Branson. Isaac starts first, and he talks about his project. He says, I've got these toilets, these mobile toilets that I'm putting in informal settlements. But there's more. I've got Wi-Fi hotspots in those toilets. And then, and then I, I rent those out to women. They make a living, and that's my project. And Branson goes, boy, oh boy, I need 300 of those, and I'm going to put British Airways logos all over them. <laughs> and then it's my turn. <laughs> and I say, well, you know, I'm a doctor, and I got frustrated early on in my cr career by seeing so much preventable illness. And uh, I, I decided to found an, an organization that was which was basically dedicated to the long-term health and sustainability of people. And the medium that we used is, is telling stories through soap opera drama, popular TV and radio dramas. And we dealt with multiple messages, and it's called entertainment education. And he said, well, so tell me what sort of impact have you had? I said, well, you know, we've, we've reached millions of people across 10 countries. Many people think that their lives have been affected in a positive way. And he said to me, but but uh, does, have you got long-term evidence? And I said, well, maybe in the next generation. <laughs> At which point, his eyes glazed over, and we moved on to the next person. Now, Isaac really did deserve to get support, because Isaac represents everything that is good about disruption. Innovation, creativity, and a whole range of sort of new bubbling up things. But what was disturbing and quite telling was Branson's reaction to both our stories or projects. You see, it's natural for us to embrace the quick, the visual, and the easily measurable. And yet we are not quite as enthusiastic about things like climate change that are not as visual or measurable and that actually take time. We're a society <coughs> that is becoming increasingly impatient, and that has led also to being impatient about doing the good that needs to be done in this world. Now, a recent study on impatience by some researchers in the US looked at this whole thing about how quickly people were willing to wait for a, a DVD to be downloaded, a video to be downloaded, and how, and how soon people would start to abandon do you know when they started to abandon for the first time? Two seconds. At five seconds, 25% of people abandon. At 25 seconds, I mean at, at 10 seconds, half of them are gone. Now these researchers are very worried that it's someday soon that we will be too impatient to study patience. <laughs> but for thousands of years, patience has been a virtue and not a vice. And nothing has brought that home to me more than my own experience. I, I went from school here in South Africa, finished here. I then went to a school in London. 
And the experience of the, of the cathedral builders, I, had, I, had a, I was, went to a sort of little, little chapel. Uh, it was, that was our school <laughs> chapel. Uh, it, it was called Westminster Abbey. And I used to wander around Westminster Abbey, and I used to be absolutely in awe of these vaulted ceilings, these extraordinary stained glass windows, the carvings. And they all seemed to combine beautifully in a way to actually make one feel closer to the divine. But I often used to think, had the cathedral builders lived to see this? And the often the, the answer to that was no. Westminster Abbey was constructed, construction began in 1245, and it was completed 272 years later. Now th think about this as a cathedral builder at that time. Think about this is that you lived in these small grass huts or small huts, and yet you were taken by this extraordinary vision of what could be, and you were willing to, to build a structure <coughs> of beauty for the next generation. And in fact, you were willing often to know that you would not be there to see the results. Now, as a result of their selflessness, many people, including myself, have and continue to go to these cathedrals and find peace, they find community, and they find inspiration in the walls that their forefathers constructed. So a lot of our current prosperity is actually built on these values. And the, the uh, philosopher, the German philosopher Max Weber, he called it the Protestant work ethic. And it basically is this, it's hard work, it is diligence, it is about long-term vision, it is about others before self, and it's about delaying gratification. And you don't actually need to be a Protestant to understand the wisdom in that ethic. In South Africa, the struggle against apartheid had that as a real ethic. People lived and they died for an ideal that many people did not see to be a reality in their lifetime. So how and why, if a ethic <coughs> that has served us so well, um, how and why has it begun to disappear from our society? Now there seem to be a number of factors, but one quite interesting factor is, you know, we're not actually wired to be patient. We're actually wired to be impatient. And if we sort of cast our mind back to the lies of our <coughs> ancestors, we actually think about what it must have been like in, in an era of, or a, a time when resources were very scarce. And like, you might not know where your next meal is. So you see that, that buffalo on the horizon, and you go and you hunt it down, and you stab it. And you don't think, well, I'll just store it for the next generation. No, you sort of, <laughs> you know, built on. Um, you eat it right there, and you eat it then, because you don't know when your next meal is coming. Um, but then as things became a bit more affluent and we had more resources, our society basically learned to put in some of the checks and balances to curb our natural impatience. Because we weren't rewired. We still wanted it and we wanted it then. And then at some point, um, we basically got to a point where this has become something that we, that that is just with us now. It is a beast <coughs> that has emerged in our midst. We are quite comfortable with the fact that we are now impatient. And there's a whole edifice that is actually constructed to, to help us with our impatience, particularly in the digital world. And uh, you know, want a date? Try Tinder. You'll, get a, you'll meet up right now. Uh, you want a TV? Click. You can have it in two days. Double click, a little bit of pain for the wallet. You can have it tomorrow. Want a bed? Airbnb. Do you want a taxi? Try Uber. But this beast that is uh, emerged in our midst of impatience is insatiable. And the more we feed it, the more we want. So soon I'll just think, I want a TV, and boom, there will be my TV. <laughs> but you know what? That in itself will not be enough. Many place the, the global financial crisis firmly at the feet of the beast of impatience. We know that, that everything has been set up to fund our wants and not our long-term needs. And even the corporate edifice or corporate structures are set up to, to, rec to basically uh, give people rewards for short-term gain 
rather than contributing to long-term and sustainable companies. And it's not just the corporate world, because the beast of impatience is roaming wild and free in the world of, of social change. Because exactly the same incentives about you know, measurement around immediacy that are there for the corporate world are also there for us. You think back to that Branson example. And we are set up now measurement in itself, and short-termism is not a bad thing. But we assume, and in fact it's led to a lot of good, but we assume that everything worth doing is easily measured. And that everything <coughs> worth doing can be done shortly and in short bites. And I think as we've heard from our previous speaker, things like climate change actually need long-termism. So I love to think of a measurement specialist being actually teleported back into this time when they were building this cathedral, sort of like three years in, and he's been given a, uh, the, the funder said, listen guys, you need to go and check out how the cathedral's going, we've given you a grant, three years, he arrives there, and there's our stonemason, and he's hacking away at a block, and there's a whole lot of rubble, and he says, I, but, I, but I thought that we funded you to build a cathedral. I see no evidence of a cathedral. <laughs> and he, uh, the stonemason replies, well, I think, you know, maybe wait another 200 years. <laughs> but there are encouraging signs out there that this beast of short-termism is finally, we're beginning to realize that short-term does not necessarily good for us or for our society. And in fact, some enlightened business leaders are leading the way. A business leader by the name of of Mr. Paul Pullman, who is actually the head of Lever Brothers, has realized that for the long-term benefit, not just of his business, but of society, he's got to look long-term. So what is one of the first things he did? He abandoned quarterly results. And now, one of the, you know, and this, is, this has been seen in other places, France's GDP, they realize that GDP is not just a good measure. We've got to look for other measures that give us a better sense of the long-term health of our society. And at an individual level, what is so exciting is that many people are beginning to understand that their contribution can be measured more than just in their salary checks. And they are looking for value, to add value to their world and not just to take value from their world. And we are seeing this, they are looking now for relationship more relationships rather than Facebook friends. And they are also volunteering for things that don't directly benefit themselves. And the very good thing is that actually patience, self-control and delayed gratification can be taught. And like any other habit, it can be practiced. And the more we practice patience and self-control, the more we can actually do it. So that is the exciting things that are actually on the horizon. So in conclusion, what, is, what does this actually mean for us as social change people, people who are wanting to leave this planet in, a, in the better state than we, than we found it? I think that what we've got to do is that we have got to embrace the current. We've got to embrace the quick, the new, the disruptive. But we mustn't abandon these amazing values that have held society and have served us so well through the centuries the values of perseverance, of self-control, of long-termism, and of actually standing in the wake of disappointment and moving forward. And so a challenge for myself and for the others around me and an, and an inspiration is, is to not abandon these values, to think long-term. I know that I may never see the change that I want to see in this world. But I do know that the work that I do has the potential to lead to the success of future generations. And that is enough. And for those of you that want to support this work of, of, of making this world a better place, you have an important role. You have a really important role. Play the long game. Know that change takes time. Support the long-term change. Celebrate with us the quick wins. When we flag, help us rise. But don't get taken in by this beast of short-terminism that demands that you move on to the next quick and good thing. 
So the final question is, do they still build cathedrals? And the answer is yes. The Barcelona Cathedral, Sagrada Familia, began in 1882. And they think that it will be completed when? In 2032. In 2032. Now the architect, Antoni Gaudi, he actually died in 1926 when this was only 20% complete. And when he was asked, he said, why have you got such long construction plans? He said, because my client is not in a rush. <laughs> and nor should we be.